Hello, my friends, and welcome to the 85th episode of Patterson in Pursuit. Happy Easter. This episode, I'm talking with Dr. Brian Kaplan, who is a professor of economics at George Mason University, and we're talking about his new book, The Case Against Education, a plus for the book title. Dr. Kaplan was last on the show back in episode four. So he was one of the very first guests that I had on Patterson Pursuit, and it's great to have him back on. And we're talking about the question, should everybody go to college? It's a question near and dear to my heart. I've got some pretty extreme views on the topic. Dr. Kaplan has much more uh, moderate views than I do, but compared to the mainstream, he actually has some pretty radical ideas and suggestions. I'm sure you guys will enjoy our conversation. If you want to pick up a copy of his book, you can find it at the show notes page this week, which is steve-patterson.com slash 85. One announcement before we start, I'll be doing a live Q&A this April 25th at 7 Eastern for everybody. It's not just for my patrons. Usually I do the live stream Q&A for patrons, but this is going to be open to any listeners of the show or the YouTube channel or social media or whatever it is. If you've got some questions about metaphysics and epistemology or the philosophy of math or my travels or politics, whatever you want to talk about, if you've got a question for me, I will try to answer it on April 25th. All right. I hope you guys enjoy my conversation with Dr. Brian Kaplan. All right, Dr. Brian Kaplan, thanks so much for coming back on Patterson in Pursuit. Thanks a lot for having me. So last time you were on the show was almost two years ago. And wow. we, yeah, we were talking about uh, anarchism, and we even mentioned then the case against education. So it's great that uh, I've been ready for it, and it's great that almost two years later now it's out in print. Congratulations on that, by the way. Thanks very much. So where I want to start is with a general claim that you encounter everywhere, especially in America, maybe the West at large, and it's the idea that in order to have a successful career or even a successful life, you have to go get some education, whether it's definitely got to be high school, that's not even uh, up for debate, but really if you can make, if you can make it work to go get your BA, go get a BA. If you can get any higher education above that, definitely go get that. It's always going to pay off. No questions asked. I know my dad kind of had this perspective uh -huh. growing up. My brother and I went to the same college and it was like, look, I know you guys are frustrated with going there, but it's just going to pay off because that's the way the world works. What do you think about that? It's overstated, but basically true. So I mean, what I say in the book is that the main problem for college paying off is just whether or not you'll finish. So, the, and uh, here's the thing, is that finishing is, is quite predictable. The best predictor of future performance is past performance. So if you did poorly in high school, then you're probably not going to be able to finish college. And in that case, I say it's not a good investment. Mm -hmm. On the other end, though, if you are someone with a high probability of finishing, then even after making a lot of different adjustments for that you might that uh, or th that make sense to make, still it looks like you're getting a quite nice financial return. Now it's not true that there's no other way to be successful in the United States. That's crazy. If you go and look at the whole distribution of earnings, you'll see people with uh, who are very successful with high school degrees or even dropouts. It's just that it's a lot less likely. Mm. And furthermore, it does seem to be partly causal. That's that's important. I see partly, but. So it does, you know, it does seem that on average, if you go to college and finish, this will actually cause you to have higher earnings on average, although, again, your mileage may vary, and yes, and you can go and find exceptions. And the exceptions are not phenomenally rare, but still, mm -hmm. if you're just trying to gamble sensibly, then I would advise people that are likely to finish college to do it, unless they've got some great other idea. So why is that the case? Because I think back on my college education and the conversations I've had with people um, who are not too impressed with their education. We didn't really learn very much. In my case, I have a BA in political science, and I like to say 90% of what I learned was just garbage anyway. Um, right. However, it did help me get my first job. As, yeah, of course. As frustrating as that is. So what's going on here? Why is it on the mm -hmm. one hand, and it seems to be that... Uh, what you You're, learn in college in many cases is not really applicable to the real world and people mm -hmm. forget it a lot of times. And yet it seems like going and getting your degree still has some kind of financial benefit to it. Yeah. So it's the great contrast between the limited learning and the large earning that you're getting. And uh, this is really the heart of the book. So there's something called the signaling model of education. And it says that one reason why education pays is that 
you are impressing employers. You're jumping through hoops, you get certification, you get stamps in your forehead, and this is impressive. Of course, there's also the simpler story that you go to school, that you go to school and they pour skill into you. And again, I don't, I certainly don't deny that. You got literacy, numeracy. You you learn that in school. Use that in the job. But what about all the other stuff, right? That 90 percent that you're talking about, and that's where I bring in the signaling story and say a, lo a lot of what's going on in school is just that you are be or you are convincing employers of your worthiness for job training. Mm. Right, it's true that you haven't actually acquired much in way skills, but you say, "Hey, look at me! I finished my my BA in political science." Like, all right, I'll give you a chance, kid. Right. Whereas if you had dropped out right before the last final exam, then you <clears throat> then you probably would just be having your application thrown in the trash. Now, when you say that, there's a lot of people who are going to get their feathers ruffled, and mm -hmm. they're going to say, "No, no, 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 no. That's very that's very crude. You're taking all the beauty out of the educational <laughs> system by saying it's not about the skills that you learn. It's not about preparing." in a practical way it's just putting a stamp on your forehead mm -hmm. you, you got to back that up i mean but, but like the the idea at least i was certainly taught this and i'm sure a lot of people were is like it's all about becoming enlightened like you go into the school a uh, uh, kind of a savage and you encounter all these ideas and the professors and the situation it enlightens you and then you're just like more productive because of it like a better employee because of it Right. I mean, there's so many different things you could be talking about there, but uh, let's just, you know, like, like just the, to start, there's, well, when are you going to use the actual course material on, in, in real life? And that by that test, then people usually like, yeah, well, hmm, <laughs> um, yeah, probably never. Every now and then someone will give a bizarro story about how, well, once in my whole life I used something that I learned in a political science class, and so that means the whole process is worthwhile. Right. And, and, you know, so like in the book, I actually tell this anecdote. There's a guy who said, look, um, it turned out it was really useful for me to learn French in high school. I'm like, oh, it was? And he says, yeah, because once I was at Charles de Gaulle Airport and there was an announcement that my flight was moved to a different gate or something like that. And <laughs> uh, and if I didn't speak French, I would have missed that and then I would have missed my flight. Like so, it was worth spending three or four years studying French in high school to avoid missing one flight <laughs> decades later. That sounds like a great deal to me. Mm. Come on, right? So that's where I, I go and went and compare this these arguments to the show Hoarders. You know, where the like, you know, this is a reality show about right. people who have like giant stacks of phone books and they're like filling their house. And again, if you go and ask people, like, well, why can't we just throw it out? The standard answer of these people is, I might need it. Right. I might need it. And it's like, well, strictly speaking, I guess that's true. There is a chance you'll need your trash. Maybe you'll need a phone book to to, to crush an intruder, <laughs> right? And that'll be just what you needed at that very time. But come on, that right. is not a sensible reason to, to to hoard phone books, right? And a sensible person weighs the probability and the cost before when they're doing this stuff. So I'd say the same thing for course material. Now, another story that people have is that, all right, sure, fine, you're right, you caught us, you're not going to use political science in real life, but they say you're learning how to learn, you're right. acquiring critical thinking skills, right? And, you know, this is an interesting story. It's one that teachers generally just assume to be true, but there is a whole discipline that studies this and tries to measure it. It's called educational psychology. And what I say, if you go and read them, they're very pessimistic about these arguments and they just don't find much evidence that it's true. Yeah, and my for my own bias and my own personal experiences in the, in the circle of people that I um, keep around me, the idea that students are learning critical thinking skills is <laughs> totally bizarre. There's not critical thinking skills from the students, um, and I'd say there's not a lot of critical thinking skills being demonstrated from mm -hmm. even the professors. Yeah. It's like the idea that you're learning something from this group of people that maybe they don't even manifest the skill themselves is completely ridiculous to me. Yeah, I mean, so since uh, you were talking about being a devil's advocate, let me play devil's advocate okay. against myself here, okay. <laughs> and, uh, right? And you can say, all right, look, compared to what? All right, you may say college students barely engage in critical thinking, but you know how little critical thinking high school students engage in, mm. right? And I do talk about research on this, and it is true that if you give you know, plausible tests of critical thinking, and especially the ones I like are ones where – they don't tell you to do critical thinking. They just give you problems and see what you do with them, mm -hmm. right? Well, you'll see that people with more education generally score, get higher scores on these tests. But here's the interesting thing in the research, and now I will break character and go back to being me, is that they generally find that there's very little improvement between freshman and senior years. 
Right. So what's going on is rather that the people with better critical thinking skills more likely to be uh, to advance to the next stage, but it doesn't seem like they're actually being transformed in the process. Rather, they're just using the advantages that they arrived that they had when they arrived. Exactly. And that so how do you try to sort out that question? Is it the case that mm -hmm. the people who go into college are naturally those that are going to have mm -hmm. some greater ability uh, versus they actually learn something there? Like, is that mm -hmm. how do you even approach trying to answer that? Well, I mean, what researchers usually do is they try to get a measure of how good you were when you started and then compare it to how good you are when you finished. So that's a, that's the, the, you know, so that study that I was mentioning did exactly that. Uh, another approach that I use uh, is this. We just go and measure the totality of what adults know and then say school could not have caused more than 100 percent of that. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and for many subjects, this will give you the answer of people, school teaches essentially nothing because adults know essentially nothing about the subject, right. even subjects where people spend years studying in school. So the one that I think is most shocking is for foreign languages. Uh, so tip a typical high school student in the U.S. will do two years. If you're going to college, probably three years or even four years. And yet if you go and, and actually just ask American adults – whether they learn to speak a foreign language very well in school, under 1% say yes. Wow. Under 1%. So, you were, you know, in this, we're not talking about they spent five weeks in school on it and they, and they don't, didn't learn yeah. to speak it very well. We're talking about years and years, and yet people, by their own admission, their own self evaluation, which of course tends to be inflated, say that they just didn't learn to speak it very well. Yeah. And we can see very, very similar things for history, for civics, for science. If basically, if you give American adults, the easiest conceivable questions on these subjects. I mean, just, just stretch your imagination. What is the dumbest question I can ask about these subjects? <laughs> like, and again, I'm, ta I'm talking, you know, like a, like a literal question that is, uh, that is included in one of the main surveys is, does the earth go around the sun or the sun go around the earth? Questions like this, you know, like on average, Americans will be able to get half of them right. <laughs> now, do, so, do you put stock I, in something like that? And that's hard. That's hard to conceive that it is actually the case that half of the people we're talking. I don't know if, if that were generalized to the public. 150 million people don't know that the Earth goes around the sun. Yeah. I, so, again, that's that's one where you might think people are just hastily not answering the question. But now, yeah, I mean, like, in, you know, like, we, like, like, uh, do antibiotics kill viruses? Another question on the science test. Right. All right. Uh, everything is radioactive. That's another. That's a fun one. <laughs> oh, true or false? False. Uh, actually, true. Everything's radioactive. <laughs> that makes me think, though, that maybe w I, I could see an answer to those questions being answered that way, is to mm -hmm. say that people treat those things as a game. As like, it's like a it's like satirical what if humor. Like, ah, oh, what the heck? Yeah, sure. If everything's radioactive, whatever. I'm gonna go grab some coffee after this. Don't care. Yeah. So again, it's true that they that they don't care very much, but that reflects the, uh, is reflective of the knowledge that they don't have, right? You know, they don't have knowledge because they don't care. Like, no, and despite I... and despite the fact that they were made to study this for years uh, like in almost any education program in America. No, I mean to say I'm I'm being optimistic here. I'm thinking maybe they don't care about this the questionnaire. Yeah. Maybe they're they just know, like yeah they, they know the answer and they're giving false right. answers for fun. I'm hoping I mean, that's there, there's, what's there's, going there's, on. Yeah, there's, there's there's a few trolls, but no, I mean I, I don't think that's that's likely to be true. Uh, you know, like for any significant degree. I Meaning like there's you know the, you know there's a whole there's whole body research on when do people lie to researchers. Right. And basically, people lie when the question's uncomfortable mm. or awkward. But on the other hand, if their pride's on the line. If it's I, you know, you know, I want to impress people. People try. Interesting. I mean, like, like you know, like you know, here's a funny thing. IQ re, IQ tests are predictive, even though there's generally no financial reward for doing well on that IQ test. Right. And you know, like, and what's going on? It's like people don't want to look stupid. It's uh, it's embarrassing. Well, I mean, so you know, like, I'll, like I'll say, like I don't like taking IQ tests because, like, I'll I'll be I'll feel embarrassed if I don't do well enough. It's like <laughs> I'm smart, right? And then like, no, you're not. I'm like, oh man, so so don't give me the test. <laughs> so you also mentioned so that was the one um, hypothesis or the one way of testing yeah, yeah. what people learn. The first one that you mentioned was you know testing it before and then after. And I think about my own experience again. And what I'm sure is a lot of people's experience is when I went in, I got to start college young. I started when I was 16, and I didn't really care that much mm -hmm. about getting, you know, A's. I would say I was getting like B's and whatever. It was fine. I was interested in the martial arts, doing other things. But I had a girlfriend at the time mm -hmm. that was a straight A student, and she came uh, to the school that I went and was getting straight A's. And I thought, you know what? 
I think that's a good idea. I kind of like this idea stuff a lot. I think I'm going to start getting straight A's. And so I started becoming a straight A student. Mm -hmm. But that's not because of the educational system. So if somebody went in and saw my performance coming in and then went out, saw my performance coming out, they would go, oh, look, you know, we, we, we have changed this Steve Patterson. Now he's mm -hmm. a critical, uh, critical thinker and he wasn't before. But mm -hmm. that's just not true at all. It's a totally unrelated mm -hmm. experience about a personal relationship that, you know, changed, that, changed my grades. I mean, even even in your story, it seems like when you decided to become a straight A student, you probably started learning more, right? Uh, I, I so here's what I did is I learned how to regurgitate very well. So I learned how uh, to get A's. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah, I don't exactly equate that with mm -hmm. learning, but I guess it's learning one yeah. <laughs> learning yeah. one thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, like like I mean, here's the thing: like even even uh, just regurgitation requires a lot of knowledge, and and just being able to tell a professor what he wants to hear requires a lot of knowledge. Yeah. Okay, yes, you know, like like knowing like you know <clears throat> my prof my philosophy professor is a utilitarian, so he's going to want a utilitarian answer. Right. Most people could not do that. Right, most people could not successfully okay. tell the teacher what he wants to hear because they're so clueless. And, like, and I'm not even talking about most college students. I don't think if you if you went and told the college students, but like, like for a typical ethics class before the final exam, all right, kids, remember, the professor's utilitarian, so tell him what he wants <laughs> to hear. Like, uh, that's really helpful. Well, not. <laughs> my point in saying that though is that if somebody were try to try to gauge my intelligence or by you know mm -hmm. whatever metric going into college yeah, yeah. it would look very different coming out of college but that's because i was right. I, my yeah. values changed you know right right any of you probably actually an intelligence test wouldn't say that you had gone up very much but a knowledge test would right and again you know that's that's at least sort of the low bar for what education is supposed to accomplish mm. is just to enhance your knowledge of the subject you studied mm. uh, one of the main results that i'm talking about is actually there's like for most subjects there's little sign even that low bar is passed mm. again it, it's likely that people knew more material on the day of the final exam but you know like the reason why i focus on what adults know is that there's no reason for employers to pay you for what you used to know. Right, exactly. So if you want to say that education raises earnings by teaching people stuff, you need to show that the knowledge is retained in, into adulthood. And that's what we really rarely see or see just to a very small degree for most subjects. Right. You've got a great analogy in the book um, you're, where you say it's like the difference between a sculptor and an mm. appraiser. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the, the idea is, you know, you've got the, the Michelangelo, Michelangelo is the person who's sculpting the... Yeah, the, yeah. The beautiful statue versus, versus the person that comes afterwards and says, you know, puts a price sticker on it, says that is a nice piece of art that's there. So what is the function that, you know, the professors are playing? Are mm -hmm. they sculpting the students or are they just appraising them? Yes. And, you know, what I say is so both, but more appraising than sculpting. Yes. You know, spe and, and, you know, especially if you're understanding why do people with more education make so much more money, then the appraising seems much more important. Mm. Then you realize, like, most of the stuff that you study you'll never use again. So... How important could it really be? Now, I think when you were mentioning like, you know, like, the, you know, like the transformation, another totally different story is just to say forget intellectual matters entirely. Let's focus on the socialization, the discipline, and so on that's being, that's being mm. instilled at school. Mm. And, and this is where my answer is, all right, well, compared to what? Compared yeah. to being locked in a closet, then school is giving great <laughs> socialization and discipline. Mm -hmm. But that's not normally the alternative to school. Right, the normal you know, the normal alternative to school throughout history and around the world is work, and work provides socialization. Work provides discipline. I'd say probably better socialization and Much discipline. Better. Yes. If, if you're trying to train someone to be a worker. Yes, I, I strongly agree. And in fact, I'm still coping with some of the habits I formed in college. So I would have said uh, <laughs> prior to bad, going bad, to college. Bad, bad habits, yes. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I, I became <laughs> much lazier because I could get away with it. Because now yeah. it's like, oh, I get graded by these people who have really low standards. So mm -hmm. I can just wait until, literally can wait till an hour before class, mm -hmm. flip through all the reading to, I know I can say the right thing, get the stamp. And that's, that's effective while you're in college. But when you get out in the real world, that's a really bad habit to have. Yeah, I mean, so what's kind of funny to me is that modern K through 12, at least it it tortures you and works you pretty hard, <laughs> right? So, you know, like, you know, modern K-12 kids, they are like, you know, like they're working a lot of hours and they're not, you know, they, you'd say they're not learning much, but they're still going and jumping through hoops all day, every day. Mm. Like, you know, they, they're, they're like stuck in these classes where they have to deal with these tough social situations and that kind of thing. But then you go to college and then it's a party, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, like in the book, I talk about all the research on how much time do student, do college students today actually spend doing academic work of any kind. And it's just not much anymore. Right. So, like, you know, in the 60s, it would have been like 40 hours a week. Now it's down to like, to like 27 hours a week. So, right. like, a, a fall of a third. 
right? So, and then of course you're only actually school's only in session for like 30 weeks of the year. So, you know, like, you know, like you know, my, my general story is if high school is building up your, you know, your discipline and socialization, then college is kind of tearing, you know, tearing it back down again. And, and then like you get released and you're like, you're, and you're just like a beach bum practically. Yeah. <laughs> I, that certainly conforms to my own personal experiences, I would say. And I, there was, in fact, there was a there was this story when I was going to school that college was incredibly hard and the students were overstressed and like they would make, you know, essentially petitions for themselves. Oh, the, the poor student worker. Uh, there was a class I took on meditation and relaxation. And, and literally, I'm not exaggerating, you were allowed to fall asleep in class because you were so, so tired from all of the difficult work that people would just zonk. And, and everybody got an easy A because you didn't want to add to the stress. That would be too ironic. So I was like, uh, well, that would also be kind of funny. You say you suck at meditation. Your meditation's terrible. <laughs> right, right. Who taught you to meditate? <laughs> Practice homework, kid. Okay, so there's there's one part of the the signaling theory, uh, the the signaling theory, the signaling theory that I find uh, really helpful for for understanding what's going on in college. And I wish I knew when I was in college because it would have resulted in a lot less anger. Like I really did not like my undergraduate yeah. experience. Mm -hmm. um, and it's the idea that uh, one of the things that the professors are praised for is you might say general intelligence or something mm -hmm. like that at least. Right. And another one is conformity. Yeah. So that was a big one that I think is very much true, that in order to make it through the system, you have to have some measure of conformity. And you have mm -hmm. to be able to jump through people's hoops, even when you know it's just busy work and it's utterly ridiculous. It was incredibly hard for me to do because mm -hmm. I don't have that psychological characteristic. Mm -hmm. I'm the nonconformist. This was like pulling teeth to get it through it. But then I think about the workplace and I go, you know, it is true to say that conformity is a valuable trait Oh, yeah. from an employer standpoint. Like I make a difficult employee. I have to be self-employed because I'm not a conformist. So I think there's something, there's definitely something true in this idea that college weeds out the people who are more conformist kind of worker bee mentality versus like the yeah. independent entrepreneurial mm -hmm. types. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So this is a, you know, a crucial part of the book because there is the question, well, fine, all right, so people go, you know, get education to go and signal all this great stuff, but why can't you signal it in some other way? Why is there such a shortage of alternatives? And again, if it were just a matter of signaling intelligence, you could say, fine, give them a test, it takes three hours. Mm -hmm. If it were just a matter of work ethic, you could say, fine, like, you know, just make them work for a while. But you could do that in lots of different environments. But if you're signaling, if one of the things you're signaling is conformity, and if you happen to be in a society like ours where, where everyone knows you're supposed to go and get your bachelor's degree, then it's very hard to come up with any alternative because when you go and say, look, I'm going to signal my, conf my conformity in a, in a weird way, in a novel, original, creative, <laughs> innovative way. Right. Like there, there's a catch-22 that doesn't signal conformity. It signals nonconformity. Right. So there's what, the, what I call locked-in syndrome where once it is just standardly accepted in your society that, you know, that, ever, that you're supposed to do this, the person that doesn't do what they're supposed to do looks like a, looks like a very bad risk and employers are nervous. And again, what's, what's interesting about this is it's very sociological. If you're in a country like, I believe, England, where college lasts three years, you only have to do three years, and that's fine because mm -hmm. that's the normal thing. If you're in a country where it's four years, then you got to do four years. If you're in a country where doctors have to do a bachelor's degree before medical school, then you better do it too. But there's other countries where you can go straight from high school to medical school, and in those countries, that's okay. Mm -hmm. So the conformity is crucial, and yeah, you're right. So I mean, like, you know, like you know, people often say, well, you know, like employers are looking for people who think outside the box. And like, well, depends upon which position you're in, first of all. Right. You know, they don't you know, like receptionist who thinks outside the box or like an assembly line worker who thinks outside the box. It's like, no, like that's not what we're looking for. Right. It's disruptive. But in any case, even if you are in a more important or managerial role, still there's the, a big limit to how much nonconformity you want. You don't want someone who says, you know what? I think I should be the CEO and you should be the worker. That's <laughs> my new system. It's like, that person is very disruptive and it's hard to get stuff done. Yep. So yeah, like, you know, like like businesses are generally their team sports, and people need to work together in order to get stuff done. And you know it's frustrating if you're a nonconformist and doesn't feel very fair. 
but you know, like, it's like, like the, well, there are other people in the world, and there is a reason why they're doing this. And like, even nonconformists benefit a lot from the conformity of others because there's corn in the grocery store. If like, <laughs> like if, if everyone involved in the corn industry were big nonconformists, like how much corn could there possibly be? It's like, well, yeah. there'd be a thousand different kinds of corn, but maybe like one stock each or something like that, <laughs> because like they just wouldn't w- wouldn't work it into a, a like a, a nice clean system. So right. Now, I self-identify as a nonconformist also. Uh, how, as to how I got a PhD, uh, despite all of this, is because you know, I'm a very selective nonconformist. I'm someone who says, well, like, what's the system exactly? What do I have to do? What can mm-hmm. I weasel out of? I'm very, you know, very strategic in that way. But, you know, like, you know, honestly, I don't think I'd want to hire me for a normal job. Right. I mean, like I wouldn't maybe, maybe, yeah. So yeah, okay. I wouldn't want <laughs> yeah, to hire me yeah, either. Yeah. I didn't. Yeah, mean. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I, yeah, I wouldn't blame you if you said you don't want to hire me. I can totally, I totally get that. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, like, you know, like I love nonconformists. A lot of my best friends are nonconformists, but yeah, the ones who are very nonconformists, there's no way I would hire them. Right. And 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 again, it's striking. Like a lot of my favorite people, you know, like the super smart people, very creative, but uh, who underperformed academically. And they're they're fun. I love them. Yeah, and uh, don't want don't want to hire them. And and what's the the uh, the explanation for them underperforming academically? You know, if if somebody's a nonconformist and says that you know I'm going to class and I am not learning and everybody's a buffoon and I'm not you know the the professor has no idea what he's talking about. And therefore, I'm okay with a C. I like, I respect that. I think mean, you know, good for you. But it's going to show up you know on the record yeah. as oh he didn't put you yeah. know because it's it, when you say he didn't perform well academically, it's hard not to translate that as oh. Oh well, he's not so intelligent, or he's not so bright. Yeah. You know, that's how yeah, deep I mean, these these tra- these like associations are. I feel like. Yeah. Well, I mean, what, so what I say is that education it signals this package of traits. It signals a package of intelligence, work ethic, and conformity. And if you meet someone who has two out of three and low educational achievements, you usually you know, you know, usually assume, and correctly, I would say that the person is probably really bad in the third thing. Mm. So if there's someone who's got brains and they're hardworking, but they dropped out of high school, it's like, well, they must be have like some kind of horrible defiant er, issue, defiance issue, mm. Mm. right? Or again, if there's someone who is you know hardworking and conformist, but they don't do well, then it's like, man, this person is probably very slow because it's not you know, like you could just go and like do the work and like the, and the person has no trouble doing that, but they're still failing. How could that be? Yeah, yeah. So this is where it. Um, I really think some of your positions and like my ideas about higher ed in particular, like um, you know, college education, PhD education are going to, well, I want to know what you think. Um, so if it's true that part of what the academic process is, is um, selecting for those who are high on the conformity trait, mm-hmm. And it's the case that we assume that the academy, the professors, the teachers are these intellectuals who are you know, doing their own independent research to try to grasp uh, the truth. seems like we have some tension there. If we want <laughs> like truth seekers, you'd think you'd want the people that weren't high on the conformity. Mm-hmm. And that's certainly, I, I reveal my bias, that was certainly my perspective. That's why I'm doing what I'm doing. I very much care about the truth seeking, but... I don't fit in the academy because I think I do see groupthink, like massive groupthink in all of these different areas that I'm studying. I don't want anything to do with it. Yeah, so an optimist could say, well, don't worry about it because conformity conformity actually makes the incentive to do good work even greater because it's already a community of, of truth seekers. Ah. So basically, so yeah, so basically if you start off with a community of truth seekers, then conformity genuinely leads to more, to more truth seeking, okay. right? As everyone sits around and goes, Oh my God, there are other truth seekers here. I better be a truth seeker too. Oh, ah. really, really important. Ah. And, and if you want to look at the most functional parts of academia, you might even think that's true. So like physics or math, okay. right? You know, so if you go into math and you've got, Hey, I've got my new creative ideas on math. It's like, um, yeah, well, we think that's ridiculous. You're a silly person, and because and and that's where the conformity pressure is probably going to work, work the best. So you remember, you've got some purported alternate theorems, so maybe you disagree with that. Very but, much, actually. I was just going to yes, say, yes. math and physics. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. There is a, the extreme yeah. group think, but about some yeah. really important issues, which are still right. open for yeah. uh, debate. Yeah, I mean that's one where, like, you know, if a professional mathematician or physicist disagrees with me, then like, you know, I. 
you. I, I've seen I, I've seen the, the, them strut the, their strut their stuff so well compared to me that I I would just consider it extreme hubris on my part to disagree with them. But mm. uh, but that's know, but, yeah, be, but yeah, yes, I have to make yes. a, I have to yeah. interject. Yeah, my yes. I used to have the same perspective, and I guess I am assuming that's because you've not investigated the philosophy of mathematics because there are particular claims made about the nature of mm -hmm. infinity that I think very reasonable people can object to, and when they actually hear the yeah. claims of the orthodox mathematicians, they're like, hang on a second. Yeah. Okay, you, you really believe that's true? Yeah. So, you know, so I have read Mike Humer's book, uh, you know, Ap Approaching Infinity. Uh -huh. But I'll say, I mean, yeah, I just don't care about philosophy and mathematics okay. at all. <laughs> right. I mean, I'll, like, the, like, I'll only read one book about it because Mike Humer wrote it. But other than that, you know, so again, I'm talking about like a mathematician says, here's a problem. Here's how you solve it. Mm. And like, like for me to go and say, oh, no, you don't. Like, I mean, to me, that's just <laughs> like, 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 you know, I mean, I can't think of, there's never been a time when I disagreed with a, with a mathematician, like a professional mathematician and on something like that. I mean, you know, I guess like once or like occasionally in a, in a textbook, you'll find a typo or something like that. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah. It's usually yeah. not about the theorems and the proofs as much yeah. as it is the yeah. framing yeah. of the, the what I is agree. a number. Yeah. Yeah. Know, yeah. I mean, to, to me, math is is the theorems and the proofs and that right. other stuff is just a distraction. I don't care. You know, right. I don't know. Um, but yeah, but anyway, but then you have all the other areas where the conformity does, is not working very well, mm. right? So, you know, social sciences, humanities, and that's one where you could imagine one where, where you start off with a big truth-seeking ethos, but I just generally don't see it. I mean, so like my own field of economics, I think it's relatively healthy, but still crummy, right? right. So, you know, you know, like, and, and it's one where you know, I've studied enough for, for enough years, and again, there, there's just enough things that seem, that I'll just say, look, it's clearly wrong, and... Like, like the evidence is just isn't really being addressed. Mm. And again, like that's really like, you know, like, like, you know, the case against education, like this is going against the consensus of education economists who generally don't take signaling seriously. And in the book, I did try to compile all the evidence about why they're wrong. Right. And, and, and there I do see the conform the conformity is, is of course the big reason why most people believe it. Cause most people don't look at that much evidence. Right. Most researchers only study a small corner of the world and they sort of figure if someone else has done the real job of collating the evidence and I say, yeah, like almost no one's doing that job. Now, so, that seems like a yeah. really big deal. I mean, if yeah. this is the area yeah. that you're studying and yeah. you've done a, made a massive compilation of research and you see how myopic other researchers are, yeah. is that not a, uh, a dire critique really of the yeah. system from the purely, you know, romantic perspective that, you know, academia yeah. should be about truth seeking and that type of thing? Yeah, yeah, Terry, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's quite damning. You know, like I, I would also say that you can do the compare to what argument and say, like, yeah. who's actually uh, doing better work on the correlation between education and ideology? Yeah. It's like, hmm, That's fair. I guess nobody. I guess nobody. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, and again, in the, the book, I rely very heavily on academic research. And you know, my general approach is like the narrower and more boring the question is, the more trustworthy the research gets. Mm. Right. So, you know, like if it's like, like, what's the correlation between like education and marital status or something like that? You know, you know, you read the work, and this is to me, this is very little sign of any of anything other than uh, of anything other than truth seeking. You might just say there's sort of like laziness or myopia, but mm. again, if the question's very narrow, the myopia is not a problem. Mm. It's like you know, like you know, like when I'm holding up like like you know this book right to my eyes. All right, well, it doesn't matter that I'm myopic because mm. I'm looking at something close by, so <laughs> it's it doesn't screw me up. But yeah, on like bigger questions, anything where there's a big political slant. And, you know, anything where people want a certain answer, anything where there's just sort of received wisdom, you know, again, like then, like, you know, for social sciences, humanities, this is where I'd say the system is very disappointing. Uh, again, like, like, are there areas where people that are that are non experts are actually better than experts? I, I think that there are the ones where the ideology becomes so overwhelming. Mm. So, I mean, like, like, uh, you know, like, any, like you know, this is probably less true today than it used to be, but. You know, like just on an issue like gender differences, this is one where there's so much ideology saying mm. that it can't that there can't be big biological gender differences. Right. Yet common sense says there are. Right. And this is stuff where I just think the common sense is right, and the researchers are just so desperate to not find that result in many cases. Again, I think things have improved quite a bit. So, like, you know, and common sense is getting is you know is you know like you know, it's getting more more of its voice heard. And of course, mm. as you might expect, when people start doing real scholarship on it, they'll find wow, common sense does look right. Yeah, go or, figure. Or, men or, and women are different. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Or you know, or, or or another one that uh, is going to be a big deal for me coming up. So. You know, uh, you so me like the well, you know, so the project after the one after the next one is a book on poverty, 
And this is one where, again, oh, yeah. there's sort of a, there's like an, there's a, like elite view that poverty is just caused by external circumstances, and then there's a common sense view of it's you know, it's caused a lot of it's caused by bad behavior. And yeah, and again, this is one where I think that the bad behavior story is greatly underrated. Yep. Right. And but at the same time, I'll say if you go and 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 read academic research carefully, a lot of times there's someone who produces a ton of evidence which supports the common sense view, but then sort of at the end of the last chapter, they uh, they will say, now of course this all confirms that social forces yes. are very important. Yep. And it's like, hmm. I mean, that sounds like like you could have written that regardless of what the, the last chapter would have been the same regardless of what you found when you actually looked at the world. So I'm going to be very I'm, I'm very pleased by all the stuff that you did when you were actually looking at the world. But now when you go and tell me what to think about your results, that's where I'm going to discount your view a lot because you seem like it seems like there's it's so important to you to get a different answer. Right. And I wonder and if have, that's reflective of their own personal yeah. beliefs or if it's the reflective right. of the kind of institutional bias that maybe they're not yeah. maybe going to cause uh, uh, some a more ruffling of feathers if yeah. they actually follow their conclusions to their logical yeah. end. Yeah, so like, like both things are going on. I think ultimately most people are conformist, and so you don't need to, you know, like you know, like people. There's not that many people who are deliberately toning things down to avoid getting people upset at them. I think there's just a lot more people who have just drunk the Kool Aid, and they, mm. they 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 genuinely believe it. But but you know sometimes when you talk to people off, uh, talk to researchers off the record, they will mm. go and say things, and they'll say and they'll say, well, why did you say that in the book? And like, well, yeah, well, I didn't say the book because I didn't want everyone to yell at me. Yeah, well. Although, although, Although there's other people who will say, like you talk to them and you understand, I'm surprised you did say it. And they'll say, well, I just tried to be very diplomatic about it, not to not to use words that would upset people. And you know, and by the way, of course, you know, like so, I think it's very important to be self-referential about these arguments you're making, Steve. So, like honestly, like you know, so I have a lot of ideological views, and I am self-aware of this. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to be a crummy person who just goes and force feeds the world into my ideology machine and comes out with it comes out with a certain answer. For sure. So so I do try to have a lot. You know, I have a lot of safeguards that that I put in, which again, like ultimately, like you might say, still don't work. And like if someone read the book and say this still seems like a big a big ideological work, I would say, well, maybe I should try harder. But mm. I mean, I mean, if I could just talk a little bit about the you know some the things that I did in order to yeah. To try to try, you know, try to try to self police. For sure. So I mean, so like one thing is like for every topic, uh, you know, like I would just like go to Google Scholar and just really try try to look through the like the you know the top two two hundred hits on each topic, topic by topic. So try to break it into small topics where and then and then when you're thinking about the topic, don't try I, I like consciously say don't try to go and figure out. And like, like, like reason backwards, what's the answer I want to make my book to make mm -hmm. uh, for my book? Mm -hmm. Instead, just in each case, just go and read a big pile of stuff and say, well, on on topic number one hundred and seventy three, what do pe what do people who have looked at, who have looked carefully at the numbers think about it? And and then I just try to assemble the book at, you know, by snapping together all of these sub exercises, all these sub research or a sub research a research, a research a of sub research. Uh, rather than to trying to reason backwards, what is it that I want to find? Mm. So yeah, yeah, like when I'm doing like this learning how to learn thing. I mean, okay, I, you know, on some level I know, right? Well, I, I kind of need the answer to be that there's not very much, but <laughs> at least to do my best to put that aside and just say, all right, forget that, and certainly don't go and search for people that agree with that conclusion. Instead, search search on the topic. Mm. So search on the topic and try to do that. Uh, so that's one big thing that I do. So, and you know, another thing is that you know, like each time, you know, right before I write a section, I reread everything that I've read, and then also try to read a bunch of other things at the very last minute. And then as I write the section, I try to have the stack of directly relevant papers right there when I write it. All right, mm -hmm. and so that's 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 another check. So basically, at the time that I'm writing any given page of the book, that is where I will I will know more about the topic at that on that day than I ever will than I ever have before and ever will again. Right. So, so that's that's something else that I'm doing. And then the the, the last thing that I do is uh, like like so when I had a good draft, I actually had my my RA get the email addresses of every living person that I cite, right? Or at least try. Sometimes there's people that you just can't find, but I think he was able to find maybe eighty percent of the email addresses of people who are alive. Sometimes I actually email them and it turns out they're dead. But mm -hmm. anyway, but, yeah, but basically email every single person that that I can find that I cite. And I, and say, look, I cite you know, like you know, this is my book. I cite your work. I'd be happy to give you the entire book to re to, re to read, or I could just go and tell you what sections where I cite your work, mm. and then you tell me whether I've accurately summarized your work. No. Right? And, and, and I and I really did do this. 
Uh, and I, I think, you know, so I'd say probably about 15%, one, five percent of the people that I email go and write me back. Mm-hmm. And, and then, you know, and, and like when, and if ever they have an issue with how I'm summarizing their work or anything or anything else, uh, you know, I try to take that into account. Of course, if it's just general comments, I try to take that into account, but I kind of expect people to disagree with, with the general perspective. But what I really take seriously is a researcher who says you have, you have misstated my conclusion. Right. Um, now that hardly ever happens. Right. But, but again, that, the, you know, like, and especially if you're being, inter, uh, being interdisciplinary as I am. So, I mean, this book is not just about economic, you know, based upon economic mm-hmm. research. It's based upon, uh, you know, sociology, based psychology, uh, you know, education, you know, the field of education. So, I try to go and overcome the problem of the autodidact that there's stuff that is known but not written down in other fields by going and approaching people as much as I can. Mm-hmm. Right now, again, I'm, I'm aware there's a bunch of problems with this. Probably people who like me are more likely to write back, and I'm aware of that. But, you know, I tried. I really so, did. <laughs> so, so that last section is interesting. You mean to say that you sought out some type of peer review that wasn't the formal peer review system? Yeah. You I personally... Yeah. I, I, I bring that, I say that facetiously because um, yeah. when I wrote my first book on philosophy, I got a bunch of flack from academics who said, oh, this is not officially peer reviewed. There's no way it could be high quality. And I said, no, no, there are people, there are philosophers who I very much respect, who I did personally correspond with for mm-hmm. the same reasons that you did. Mm-hmm. And I got, I value their yeah. feedback and I incorporate it into mm-hmm. the book. So yes. I think that's a much stro- way stronger mm-hmm. process of peer mm-hmm. review than yeah. the actual, you know, the formalized one. Yeah, I mean, you, like, so your thing is harder for an external reader to verify that it really happened. Right. And they're also concerned that you're only talking to people who agree with you. Right. Um, but you know, so you know, like, like, um, you, like, like, honestly, like, 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 you know, listening to what you said, what I would do is drop the philosophers I respect thing and just send it to a ton of people. <laughs> Here's the thing, though, you you say that <laughs> they, they won't they but, won't they won't read it. Well, they they won't read it, but even if they do, um, to be honest, I'm so deeply unimpressed by the state of modern mm-hmm. philosophy and modern thinkers in general, mm-hmm. that uh, it's presumptuous, but most likely it's going to be terrible feedback. It's going to be criticisms of me as a person. It's going to be not understanding the topic that I'm mm-hmm. talking about. Like, th- um, so I had a, I had a, a professor review the book and it was a, it was mm-hmm. a nightmare mm-hmm. and revealed that there was an incredible myopia, even in somebody reviewing the book, talking mm-hmm. about logic and like the different, mm-hmm. the different laws of logic, difference between propositional logic and other things where it was like, criticisms of my work that are just factually wrong and if the individual was more aware of their own field those criticisms would have been made mm-hmm. so yeah. i have I, I have such low yeah. respect for in mm-hmm. general your average phd that i really don't care that much about their mm-hmm. feedback because i just see over and over they don't really know what they're talking about yeah i know it yeah, sounds I, arrogant I, I, but yeah. yeah you know i mean like i mean i feel the same way but a lot of times but I humble myself and do it anyway <laughs> you, know, you know so like honestly like you know yeah. like you know like i like you know, like you know, if you know, like if I were actually criticizing someone in print, I like I like like like, you know, like and especially if it's you know for a book or something like that, like even when I think that they're an idiot or they're crazy, like I, I try to, I go out of my way to go and send it to them and say like well what do you say about this yeah. just and again just you know like the natural human tendency is arrogance. Yeah, I, I know this because I there isn't a time in my life when people didn't call me arrogant from the earliest age, <laughs> I, you know like like like, like, like and so. On the one, you know, like I don't think my personality is likely to change, but uh, you know, st- still, like, you know, like, like if you really want, want to seek the truth, you've got to go and say, yeah, well, I am arrogant, and and like, of course, that inclines me to think I'm right, regardless. So let me go and try to go and do a bunch of checks, which my own personality tells me are totally unnecessary. Yeah, and that's what makes me nervous and makes me want to do it, and and I think I need to do it anyway. And I and like, you know, it's bitter for me. Like, like the way that I read feedback generally is. When I receive it, I don't even read it at first. I just print it and put it in a stack. Yeah. And then I go and read it all on like two or three terrible days of my life when yeah. I just go and read the stuff and like, oh man, like the, they're coming, like they don't like this, they don't like that. I mean, so partly it's just, I mean, it's just you know, like I need to get in a state of mind where I'm ready to be criticized. Mm. But also, I think that, that it's very helpful to go and read a bunch of criticism at once. Oh, yeah. Then, then you can go and compare, see, is it, are there patterns? Or like you know, a bunch of people say I'm wrong about something, or yeah, is it yeah, just yeah. this person with a different complaint? Yeah, for sure. I mean, criticism is massively important. And I, I don't, you know, I don't respect the people I respect because they agree with me. I, I respect because I, mm. I think they actually know what mm. they're talking about. And I, I mm. deeply value criticism. Um, but mm. I think what in this, just in that short exchange, I think that's the difference between a little bit more conformity and nonconformity because... Truly, deep down, I do not respect 
uh, the actual understanding of the people who are supposed to be knowledgeable and at least my areas of philosophy and the things that I talk about. And so mm -hmm. the, the analogy for me is imagine I'm writing about, you know, some topic in ethics or whatever, and I get a whole bunch of theologians and pastors from the local area who say, Steve, you know, we've looked at what you've said and we have these criticisms and it's like, okay, I, I, I hear you, I hear your words, but I've also I'm very familiar with these ideas of the what the pastors the pastor criticism mm -hmm. I grew up in that and I mm -hmm. just don't think it's very good I think all of them like systemically mm -hmm. yeah they're not good so so maybe there's going to mm -hmm. be a few pastors that I think I respect and will listen to the rest of them really mm -hmm. I don't find their mm -hmm. commentary mm -hmm. sophisticated yeah so you know like, like I find that was helpful is like narrowing the question down mm. so you know like, like you know I wouldn't say I you know like you know Lutheran pastor if I, I wouldn't take his well, like put much stock in his answer to the question was Luther good, <laughs> right? But on the other hand, it's like, you know if the question were narrowed down to like you know, you know, like what were the main disagreements between Luther and his wife on theology, hmm. right? If we got down to a question like sure. that narrow, or you know or like you were like what was the topic of this debate that Luther had with some other you know with, with mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. you know like you know some bishop on a certain day. Mm -hmm. Again, like, like you know, as you get it narrower and narrower, yeah. more and more myopic, that's where I just trust people more. Yeah. Again, sometimes you'll just find that someone is a purported expert, but they don't seem to know any specific facts, and then you're just like, my God, this is terrible. Yeah, and but, that's, you know, that was one of the realizations I had when I was in college, and I knew a fraction, of, like I didn't have a decade of independent research that I've been doing, that I would, I there was one economist on campus who mm -hmm. I spoke with, who I somehow in my year and a half or two when I was there of researching economics at the time, I knew more than he did. I was aware of more uh, theories than he did. Like he, he, he had heard of the Austrian school of economics, uh, but he was like, oh, yes, yeah, so that if I were an Austrian, I wouldn't have a job. Ho, ho, ho. And then we talked about some of the ideas and he was like totally clueless. I'm thinking if it's the case that me – I know more than the professor. How is that possible? This guy clearly mm -hmm. cannot know what he's talking about because I don't know what I'm talking about, but I know more than he does. So mm -hmm. I've had that that type of realization, mm -hmm. and it's not just in economics. It's yeah. a lot of areas. It's like if you demonstrate that you know less than I do, there is mm -hmm. no possible way that you can know what you're talking about because I don't. Mm -hmm. Well, unless you uh, – there's uh, some areas he knows more than you do and some areas where you know oh, more than he does. Of course, yes, of course. Which, yeah, so, oh, yes. Yeah, so oh, I don't yeah. mean it as a blanket yeah. statement. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you know, so, you know, so well, which is all you know, very likely to be true. You know, there's there's there are a lot of professors that I've talked to where they have giant blind spots, and yet I still value talking to them because sure, sure. in the area where they where they where they actually specialize, they know their stuff. Sure. And you know, I can I can think of them as a weak thinker overall, just because they're the, you know, like they're so narrow. But um, you know, you know, like, like like honestly, like like just in terms of, of you know learning in general, you could either focus on what people don't know or what they do know. Find a lot, I, I get a lot more out of people if I say, well, like what what is this guy good at, if anything? And you know, like you know, it's like, there are some people who are just who just suck across the board, but you know, there's like there's not that many who are that bad. Uh, you know, so you know, uh, you know, it, it, like it's it, like it's more of a matter of well, what is what is your thing? Okay, that's your thing. Okay, mm. so I figured that. You would know a lot about world history as an historian, but you mm. just don't, and you don't even pretend to. Mm. So, all right, what you know about is the history of Albania. All right, well, that's interesting. Let's talk about Albania then. So, and, the, you know, so this is a great segue then for uh, the feedback that you have received so far. Mm -hmm. I guess I have two questions. Mm -hmm. One, how far outside the mainstream are you with the conclusions in the book? Like you said, mm -hmm. signaling theory is not very popular, but it seems so. Right clearly correct mm -hmm. it's so airtight that right. i want to know how much outside the mainstream is and two um what's the feedback you've actually received specifically on the book uh -huh. from your your fellow academics right. right so there's a few different mainstreams to think about so there's mainstream like education labor economics and there i think that i am way outside so i mean like, like in terms of how important i think signal educational signaling is compared to like the whole distribution I think of at least the 90th percentile of uh, maybe the 95th or even the 99th. Um, now, it, uh, there was actually one survey of just economists in general, not specialists, but, but economists in general. And there, I don't, uh, there my views are actually not so extreme. So mm -hmm. there maybe I'm like in the 75th or 80th percentile. But uh, now this is you – know, you know, like I have a whole section in the book saying hmm, this is pretty nerve-wracking for me because it's the people who know the most about the subject who disagree with me the most. Yep. 
and people who have you know who are smart and generally informed but don't actually study the specific issue agree with me more. So it seems like there's a a transition where you start off agreeing with me and then you learn more than you disagree mm -hmm. with me. Mm -hmm. Right. And then I have to say, yeah, but if you learn even more, then you'll come back to agree with yeah. me. Yep. <laughs> um, so, you know, again, like what's going on? A lot of it is just that I'm much more interdisciplinary than most economists. Yeah. So I, I, I mean, I, I really take seriously evidence in psychology, sociology and education, not just what economists do. Most economists have uh, who do education just have zero interest in learning. Yeah. All, all they do is want to measure the effect of education on earnings and then call that human capital. It's like, well, Hold on, maybe there's another story. Which now again, the funny thing is, um, you, you might say, well, how can your view really be so extreme when Michael Spence won a Nobel Prize for the Signal Model of Education? And the answer is, he won a prize for the model. He didn't win a prize for any actual empirical work, which mm -hmm. he didn't do on it. And again, sort of like there's there's a weird situation in economics where the, th the signaling theory has very high status. Some of the most prominent economists in the world have written papers on it. But in the realm of actual empirical work, what explains re the world, education in the real world, that's where the status is very low, hmm. right? And, uh, you know, so, so, so again, like, like that, that is, you know, like, like you know, it's, 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 a tough, it's a conundrum for me. But again, I just try to face it head on and to say what's going on is that, there, is that there's a big double standard. You know, first of all, there's a big double standard where the small amount of empirical research that's gone on in economics, people generally, if it turns out the right way, then they say, aha, signaling is crushed, and it turns out the wrong way, then they say we need to do more research or there's something wrong with the data. Right. So, and I, and I, and I document a couple of different cases where you can really actually see people even in print admitting, well, this is coming out the wrong way, so <laughs> why? All right. So, there, so there's that. Uh, you know, then I think there's just like, you know, like, you know, economists just have a general bias against common sense arguments. Mm. And I, and I think common sense is where we should always start, not necessarily where we should finish, but at least if we just begin by looking around and saying, look, you don't use most of the subjects that are taught in school on the job. So what's going on? Right. That to me is an argument that's important and not decisive, but it's convincing. Yep. And I think a lot of economists would just go you know, suddenly, oh, you can't say that. Bah, bah. And I'm like, no, not bah. Serious. It's a serious argument. I mean, I, I think what you're saying is correct, and I'm not surprised in the slightest that if you've done interdisciplinary work, then your conclusions are, I think, reasonably going to err away from whatever the orthodoxy of that yeah. particular uh, discipline is, because yeah. I've seen it in my, in my own research. Like, yeah. it just that is the common thread in every area that I've I've studied. Is there's the minority school. Some heterodox school uh -huh. that's not orthodox, they seem to get the fundamentals right. They seem to have the right perspective. And for and it synthesizes nicely with another like heterodox school. There's like a whole worldview, I feel like, that you can kind right. of piece together here that disagrees with all of the, the orthodoxies but are actually very much internally consistent and I think have a better methodology. I think the myopia, that problem, of, uh -huh. is really, really bad. Like the method, I would say it's a methodological error uh, for your colleagues, the way that you've described them doing their work, that's a really, really bad process for trying to discover truth. I mean, so your approach may be good too. I would describe my approach very differently. I would say that I tried to beat mainstream economists with mainstream psychologists, for example. Okay. I don't go and try to find some heterodox psychologists and then use them to criticize economists. I try to find like normal, boring, vanilla psychologists and say, look, this is just what a normal person who looks at the evidence con concludes and not just want a whole lot of them. Um, you know, so I, I, I still do will read the heterodox people. But again, like, like, you know, like, like I usually try to focus on questions narrow enough where – I just think like normal, boring, vanilla people are normally right, and on the other end, like heterodox people are more are more kooks. <laughs> um, again, you know, so like, you know, my general view is like you know, heterodoxy is better as a general as a general view than as and then for any specific issue. I mean, like for for any you know, if I want to find out like you know what happened at the Battle of Kirkuk, right? This is one where I would go and find like a boring mainstream person who specialized okay. in that area. I wouldn't. I wouldn't go. I wouldn't go and find like who are the radical, in, really, really innovative Kirkuk Kirk, uh, Kirkuk people. You know, so like, like that's where like hmm, that sounds so, like it's such a narrow issue that I would just distrust someone who had who had a, who was like oh but you got to understand it was totally different. But you know, again, maybe that person's right. But but again, like when it's that narrow, that's and, uh, and especially if the person has you know, has a big ideological axe to grind. That's where I don't trust them. But yeah. again, like, like, like if you were to, if someone says like, I've got a general, a different general story of, of what was happening in the first world war, 
that's where I'll say, well, that's it. That's more interesting. And that's one where it's right. much easier to believe that person is right because there's a whole ideology of what the story has to be. Yeah. And, and it's, and it's not one where studying all the particular cases automatically lends itself to an answer. It's one where it requires judgment and it requires a detachment from one society to really do well on this thing. Then any of the if there's sort of one like general general heterodox attitude that I really do that I strongly approve of, it's detachment from one's own society. Mm. So yeah. Like if you really want to understand it, forget that you're an American who lives in Virginia, who's you know who's like, like who's white or is male or has this background or was raised Catholic or Jewish or whatever. Just screw all that stuff <laughs> and just think of yourself as a Martian. Right. And, you know, and, and I, and I do try to, I do try to try to put this in there. Are, you know, people make fun of me on Twitter for being a Martian. And it's like, look, this is not what comes from my heart. I, this is a, a, a something I cultivate yeah. deliberately, consciously. I'm trying to be like a Martian, right. even though it hurts, because this is what I think gets you to the truth. No, I, I agree. And I don't think there's too much disagreement with uh, kind of the way that I'm uh, approaching things and you are, um, well, I guess probably in practice, they're, they're, it's very different. But I, I agree that the the larger, the more abstract, the more theoretical, the more mm -hmm. openness to yeah. heterodoxy there is. Especially when I, the other common trait I see when talking with experts like yourself is that a lot of times when you get to a certain level of knowledge in your own field, there's mm -hmm. a lot. There tends to be a lot of distrust about the foundations. Have the foundations of that field actually been properly established? Is the methodology mm -hmm. of economics actually properly established? Or uh, mathematics is a good one. What are the actual foundations of mathematics mm -hmm. given the overturn that happened at the turn of the 20th century? Like mm -hmm. uh, those, when you get to a certain level, you start seeing that those are really important and largely unsolved issues. And so when you look around and see a bunch of work that's being produced, given those same assumptions, it all seems dubious. It's like, well, that might be true if it's the case that these ideas were sorted out, but those were never sorted out properly. Yeah, I mean, when economists talk about the foundations of economics, this is where I'll just say you can safely ignore them because they don't know anything about it. They never studied it. They don't read anything about it. They're just, they're just going and to, and you know using the fact that they studied a subject with, with that has the same word in the title. <laughs> you know, I studied economics. Doesn't mean like e economics and the foundations of economics are two totally different things, right? And you could be a great practicing economist and just have a co com completely you know completely ignorant views about like epistemology and like like and of course they generally do. Um, but again, like you know, to me, you know, to me, what I say is, you know, like, like, well, then forget what that, what the, what their, their abstract claims about what the foundations are. Look at what they really do. Right. So again, you know, I'll say, you know, like, there's, you know, there's like Milton Friedman's, you know, you know like methodology of positive economics, which again, generally most economists have never even looked at, much less read. But they have sort of a quick summary that they've heard, and they then they'll parrot it off if the, if the, you know, if things get if you know, epistemology comes up. But I'll say, look, like you know, ignore all that stuff. What do you actually do as an economist? And it's nothing to do, like it's nothing like what Milton Friedman talked about. Milton Friedman didn't do what Milton Friedman talked about, and that's good <laughs> because if you did, if you followed the the epistemological recipe, like you couldn't, like like your work would be terrible. So mm -hmm. like like look at what people do, not what they say, right? And you know, but you know, like here's the good news: people can do great work even though their general theory is terrible. Mm -hmm. So for people that are interested in reading your book and reading more of your work in general, where can they get a copy? I'd recommend just go to Amazon. It's only 20 bucks. So can you afford not to buy The Case Against Education? I think not. <laughs> Certainly not. Well, I think uh, that's, a, that's a great note to end the conversation on. We went yep. a little bit over. I super appreciate your time. Um, yep. This has been really interesting. And uh, hopefully I'll have you back on the show. Thanks very much. Uh, continue your search. This sounds like a great idea. All right. That was my conversation with Dr. Brian Kaplan. Hope you guys enjoyed it. You know, there's something special about GMU, George Mason University. I've been to a lot of campuses all around the world now, and can't say I'm particularly impressed with uh, m most of them, but there are definitely some bright bulbs at George Mason, so credit where credit's due. They're doing some good work there. All right, that's all I've got for you today. Talk to you guys next week.